Hey, welcome back to Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show in our AI season. Um, we are talking about the details of some of the larger stuff we talked about when we introduced the topics around dangers and concerns you want to have around AI and LLMs. So let's bring the architects in to do this piece. <laughs> Hey guys. Hey everybody. Hey, it's great to see you folks again. So in our initial conversation, we were talking about model partners and picking models and stuff like that. Um, let's just refresh ourselves on what the concern, you know, what the thing is that we want to make sure we do right um, as, as sort of one of the big parts of, of and, and, you know, approaching this stuff as an architect. Um, Willie, since you are the one who set that up, can you, can you know, initially, can you just bring us with a quick reminder and then we'll get into the conversation? Yeah, so at the end of the day, there's really um, a slider of models that you can go and look into this LLM space. While it started with OpenAI and ChatGPT as the coming out party and, oh my God, what can we do? Uh, it was quickly clear that there's other models uh, that are out there from other providers like Google and so forth. And then there's an open source community, which is very, very active. And it's producing large language models, either very specialized or generalized, depending on uh, what their aim is. And so the initial idea was to say, okay, now I have potentially hundreds or thousands of models to pick from. How do I pick? What do I do? What are the concerns that I have to think through? in order to go and pick the right thing. Um, and then Eric brought something up, which I think is also worthwhile to talk about in this context. Do I build my own large language model or my own right. foundational model as they're called? And why would I do that? Uh, what are the benefits of this? I think those are the two parts of the conversation and um, love to have Eric's point of view before I uh, continue to expand on how I think about the problem. Yeah, Eric, yeah. should I build my own? I'm I'm started typing already on this call uh, on, uh, on this on this on this episode. Is that okay? Look, I think? I think I think it's going to be a slider. I'll keep this really short. Never in my career have I seen the mo the rapid uh, as rapid of commoditization around a specific technology as I've seen with generative AI and LLMs. The amount of as Liz Uli said, the amount of models that are showing up on repositories and then they're actually being hosted. The amount of hyperscalers that are now announcing that they've got their own hosted foundational model that you can just tell it information and give it libraries of stuff and it'll actually work is staggering. So like any good architect, you always have to think build versus buy. And if I decide to not build a uh, commodity and I just build novelty, what does that look like for LLMs? Well, so what's one case where you'd want to build your own? Let's, let, let's, let's just do that one for fun, because I think that's the less likely case, right? In theory. I, I think that it is, and I think that depending on your industrial vertical, your propensity to say that I'm going to need my own is higher in places like financial services or other industri industrial verticals where you're going to train this thing on a bunch of proprietary data and competitive data that you don't necessarily want to share with the world and or have it train other, you know, a, a hosted foundational model and have other competitors leverage your code, your proprietary information, your customer records. So the propensity, the instinct is to say that I got to build my own ring fence version of this thing. Whereas I think, you know, what Microsoft, Google, um, and, you know, AWS have announced recently is that, hey, we're at even OpenAI uh, and ChatGPT said, listen, your conversations are secure in an enterprise capacity. We're not going to trade on your stuff. We'll actually give you the ability to configure an LLM and you send us the information you wanted to know about. You can conduct all of your governance and all of your input and output validation around it. We'll just own the um, hosting of the model and you can get to utilize it from an API perspective. So I think that the world is rapidly moving in that direction in which organizations have to rethink and reconsider what it takes to build your own. Yeah, so let's let's rip these a little bit apart because I think we're conflating two things. So as an architect, the first decision you have to make is, can I use what's out there or do I have to build my own? Right. And that obviously has a number of dimensions. One of them is return on investment. Um, and especially with AI, to Eric's point, not only is it commoditized very fast, but it's also improving very fast. Um, so there's a lot of new capability coming out continuously. And that's something where if you build your own, you have to then figure out how do I keep up? 
because the innovation is continuing to go very fast. If you then say, okay, I'm not going to build my own, and we come back to that topic why you might want to build your own, uh, then you say, okay, which one do I pick? And there's criteria that are, are effectively the same for anything that you pick in terms of, okay, who is the partner that I'm picking them from? It could be a commercial partner or it could be an open source partner where you then, if it's an open source partner, you have to think about is the community vibrant, who is behind it, where it's coming from, um, how many check-ins have happened over the last um, period of time, whatever it is, so that you can see is this thing alive or is this stale? So there's a bunch of dimensions that apply to any open source project from my perspective and LLMs are no different. Right. And once you go and then say, okay, now I've narrowed it down, then you need to look and evaluate the LLM like you would evaluate any other technology to say, okay, does it fit my needs? Does it meet responsible AI criteria, which we talked about um, and so forth. Um, and so those are the big buckets. If you say, hey, I'm going to go with open source, then you also have to think about, uh, is it hostable? Or do I have to build it all myself? So uh, the hyperscalers, uh, Microsoft uh, for sure, has built a hosting capability as model as a service. So you cannot take any model in hugging phase and we host it for you automatically. So the infrastructure is right there. You don't have to worry about that. Um, and then you can get foundational model as a service, which is the open AI capability, either from open AI or from Microsoft or Google Gemini and AWS bedrock and so forth. And that effectively then goes and pushes, it's more like a SaaS service. Think about it that way, where the entire system is already built. You don't actually don't even have to compile the model. You just go and say, I want to use an API. And those are the decisions you have to make depending on. A, what you're comfortable with, what your strategy is as a company, is everything open source because you want to have an illusion of control um, or what it might be. And that's really the important part. And again, I would go back to the episode around charter. I would look at my charter as a consumer, but I also would look at the provider's charter. So for example, in the open source world, if the open source community doesn't have a charter for their LLM, I would certainly be skeptical. Uh, what are they going to do? What is their aim? What are they trying to achieve with this model outside of making money uh, eventually? Mm -hmm. So I personally believe that a lot of what we talked about before as a consumer should also be applied to the provider of the, the model and saying, okay, tell me what you believe AI's job is and what you are doing and what you're not going to do. And that way you can go and leverage what you're doing for yourself also to evaluate your partners that you ultimately are going to uh, utilize to drive um, the usage at the end of the day. I find myself thinking two, con two contradictory thoughts. On one hand, it, a lot of what we just discussed seemed like you would want to apply that to everything, not just not just AI. Like, how's your charter about whatever, you know, like, like, or, and, and how do I choose what kind of partner you're going to be and how vibrant are you as a, as an organization I'm going to buy something from or get pull something from. Um, so, so I, on one hand, I think, oh, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe it's not all that dissimilar and maybe we should be doing that sort of diligence all over the place. Um, and the other hand, I also think, well, good news architects, all this, all this muscle that you've built up ideally around this diligence around working working this through use it here like you you're you're good is there anything that you think in particular we should be talking about like from an architect's from an architect's perspective that you think is either new or uh, or uh, not obvious um for, around this it looks like eric like you have an answer for that yeah I, I think you're right like here in 2024 we're basically talking about the sdlc what are the requirements What's the architecture? How do I build it? How do I deploy it? How do I look after it? And repeat, right? But you're, you're correct in that looking at this through an AI, ML, LLM lens is a little bit different. So if, if for, for, for my experiences, it's going through identify your needs, define the tasks and functionality that the use case requires and how LLMs can play into that. Does your hosted foundational mom partner require text generation, code writing, does it support translation? Is it multilingual or multinational? Does it have other specific, relatively great capabilities? Are you going to need to generate images or is it just going to be text-based? Um, how do you evaluate those model strengths? Um, you know, for what are the strengths and weaknesses of each HFM platform? So 
Do they do math really well? Um, do they have data analytics capabilities? Can they produce output documents like Word documents and spreadsheets? Which ones have the best performance for your specific tasks and your specific use case? And then how consistent and reliable are the outputs of each one of those? And then the, the other dimension is, like, like we said earlier, it's the, it's the responsible AI angle. Um, bias and fairness, even if in, in a model in which I'm uploading, you know, my own data sets for consideration for responses, um, how can we understand how the data was used to train it? What are the potential biases? You may or may not be able to discern those from your, from your, uh, host foundation model partner, but how do you, how do you re remain vigilant in thinking about those things? Like Lily was saying earlier. Yeah. But again, Eric, I'm following David's path here. What you just read off is very similar to what I would do if I would pick a programming language or a database or stuff like that, where I would do exactly this, where you did put a little bit of a bias or a slant for LMMs. I think the big one for me is that the large language models are so large, um, even if they're open source, that you don't know how the technology actually functions. Uh, it's not straightforward. We can do it by math, as I mentioned before. We can say the math says that the model operates correctly, but we actually do not know the actual path of inference, what really happens inside that model. And that's, I think, the really big one. Um, even if you have an open source model, it's most likely going to be too complicated for most people to follow through the math and all this other stuff. So you kind of have to trust that this model is actually doing the right thing. And I think that's really the big one for LLMs. And when you go to these very large commercial models, again, OpenAI or Gemini, then you absolutely have to trust. And I think but, that's going to be the, the key one from my perspective. Yeah. And I think that that really is my point only, like you mentioned, like this isn't, this is just, and it is David's point also, it's just like evaluating any other SaaS service technology capability. But there are those additional considerations, but largely from an architect perspective, I think looking at it through that very same lens, is it fit for purpose and how can I trust it? And like you said, Uli, there are going to be additional dimensional considerations, which we've talked about before. We are essentially, if, we, if we're going with a hosted model, it's a black box. We have to trust that we can not know what's going on inside. We only can trust what we're putting into it from prompts and you know knowledge and the track record and the quality of what comes out of it. And we need to be vigilant and monitoring those things. But you're right to me, based on my experience in the space, it's very similar, like very SDLC like almost. It, it's super interesting to me. I mean, I, I hear all that. And I think one perhaps, perhaps difference here that I'm hearing is, you know, with a larger system of any sort that you're going to choose to decide from a partner that has a thing and you're going to buy it and you're going to use it and there's there's sort of this implicit notion that like oh yeah they can find the person that wrote that code and they can put it in front of you and that person can explain what it did or how it's supposed to work or whatever like it might possibly be explainable through a human that you could find and you could say you you architected that how does this really work in the back end um, but we're here at an interesting place where not even the people you're getting it from can necessarily say, can, can necessarily tell you the answer to that question. And that's really an interesting place to stop. Um, so it, well, I, I, I will add one, one final oh, yeah, thing that you'll let me, if you yeah, thrive yeah. on, if you thrive on determinism, this is not the place, not your, this not is your, the yeah. place for you to grow. I'll be put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate I that. Like that one. That's a good one. Okay. Well, I appreciate both of you so much. I really thank everybody who's watching this particular episode. I hope you'll join us again here on Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show.